All right, so I wanted to give a talk on uh, how our company made a transition from Hive to Spark. So our company, Bizzo, we're basically an ad tech company. I won't spend very much time on what we do, but basically we can help you get in front of the right audience. Um, you know, so if you want to reach people in finance or the medical industry, we can help you get in front of those, those type of people. So kind of a brief history of uh, kind of how our jobs were set up on Hive um, prior to 2013. Uh, we ran a lot of analytics reports, you know, so showing um, impressions, clicks, conversions, that kind of stuff. Um, and all these were generated on Hive jobs. And the way that we're set up is we do kind of like nightly log processing. And so we'd run um, Elastic Map Reduce jobs on Amazon using Hive. They would suck in data from S3, and they would save that output back, back into S3. And then we would load that into our data warehouse and then into the UI. So. When we first started using Hive, you know, several years ago, um, and nice, or at first it was really nice, because um, you can kind of run like these big data jobs um, just using normal SQL queries, right? You don't have to worry about um, a whole lot of stuff. You can just say, you know, I want to select from group I, just like writing like a normal, you know, Postgres or MySQL type of database. But there were some issues, right? Um, number one for us was unit testing. Um, it was very difficult to write unit tests in Hive because it's difficult to separate um, abstraction layers when you're just writing SQL code. And the other thing that really sucked was trying to extend parts of Hive, right? Writing um, custom UDFs and UDAFs was always kind of a pain in the ass. Um, you had to write these big long functions um, and it was just more painful than we felt it should be. So back in 2012, we went to the uh, Amazon reInvent conference. We saw the talk on Spark. And we were like, this is, looks really cool um, for two main reasons. And one is the testability reason, and the other one's the extension. And so we decided we wanted to give it a shot. So we had this new project coming up. Um, basically, what we wanted to do is we wanted this uh, report that we can compare two groups of visitors uh, that come to your website. One is that saw one of our ads, and another one is the audience that didn't. Um, and the reason why we chose this is it was kind of a substantial amount of data. We had about 30 days um, over the engagement period. So, you know, the period that you get people coming to your website when they're clicking around on stuff. And we do a 90-day look back to see if they saw an impression. So all in all, you know, this was, uh, you know, several, several terabytes of worth of data. Um, and we felt it would be like a good test pilot project for running on the Spark platform. So, yeah, the first thing is we realized was that unit testing was now really nice. Um, you could just write a normal kind of Scala test, uh, test uh, just like anything else, and it worked. So that was a big win for us. The other thing was it was now easy to extend things, too. Um, you also just write normal Scala code, right? If you want to write an abstraction method that kind of, you know, um, encapsulates some code, you just take in an RDD, which is Spark's kind of a normal collection object. Um, you do some data processing on that, and you return back an RDD. Um, and it's really easy to extend with your own custom functions. So kind of some best practices and tips that we've had um, migrating from Hive. The, the first one you kind of have to get used to is um, translating from you know, SQL code to the Spark Scala APIs, right? So um, normally in SQL, when you want to select some fields, um, that's equivalent to a map in Spark. Uh, if you're doing aggregation in the select, like if you're doing, um, you know, sum or uh, an average, um, that's typically going to be a reduce. Uh, when you say from, you're saying, okay, I want to pull data out of this table in Spark. Um, that's now an RDD. You can basically think that is think of that as a collection, like a list, uh, but it's distributed. And then, um, you know, when when you join, um, Spark has this uh, method called cogroup. That's basically the join primitive. Um, the other Methods are built on top of that, so you know you've like you have all the normal stuff you would have in SQL. You have your join, your left outer join, inner joins, all that. All that's built on that Spark uh, cogroup method. And then uh, anytime you see a where in the SQL clause, that's going to be a filter. And then group bys can either be um, a group by key or reduced by key. And I'll give some examples of that too. So just as a real quick example for translating between like you know Hive code and Spark uh, code. If you want to sum all the views in, um, from a single advertiser, then you know, we select sum from advertiser stats where the advertiser ID is one in Spark. It would look like this. We have some RDD of advertiser stat, and we're going to filter uh, such that the advertiser ID is one. We're going to map out the views, and then we're going to sum them. 
you want to do something more complicated, let's say you want to um, do a group by and then you want to sum all the page views plus all the clicks and group them by advertiser, uh, SQL that's pretty easy. Um, the Spark one's a little bit more verbose, and so what we would do here is again we have an RDD of advertiser stat which has our view and, and clicks method on it. We're going to map by the uh, the advertiser ID, and so here we we have a, a tuple two, so we have a you know an advertiser ID in the first slot, and then we have a second tuple two in the second slot, uh, where we store the views and clicks. And what this does is um, Spark has an implicit conversion available on RDDs of tuple twos. And that allows you to call methods like group by key or reduce by key on these guys. Um, and so basically what we do is for, for every line in the RDD, we map through and output a advertiser ID plus the views and clicks for that single line. And then we aggregate them in that reduce by key. Um, so that's what the V1 and the C1 are. And that's the views and clicks from the first, first one, views and clicks from the second one. We add them together and then we get aggregated counts back out. So this is kind of how we structure our data. Um, the way I like to think about it is, you know, if you're on Hive, you have tables, um, and each table has a row. So in Spark, you have um, a case class for every table row. Um, and the reason why we use case classes is because they're serializable. Def by default, Spark, you need most of your classes to be serializable when it distributes the, um, the code across the, uh, the nodes. Um, and so you just have your types and fields for each one. And each table becomes uh, an RDD of that type. Um, so typically all of our, our log files are in S3, so we just call, um, you know, from the Spark context object, that's that SC. We're going to make an RDD of type string, uh, load it from S3, and then we're going to map over each one of those string lines and turn it into an advertiser stats line. And we typically have an apply method on those case classes that can parse a string into the, into the fields. So how do we structure our Spark jobs? Um, typically we have three different classes. So you kind of have like your data classes, uh, like this average stat case class we, I was just talking about. We have an entry point, um, which we typically call like job classes. Those will take our arguments. Um, they load our kind of like uh, advertiser stat input RDDs from S3. Then they run this third class, which is our report class. Um, the report class we have just takes in an input RDD and it only returns an output RDD. Um, and the reason why we do that is it makes it really easy to test because you can consume an RDD and output the RDD um, and you can test um, the RDD results from that. So an example job, um, you know, it's pretty simple. You're going to load your input. So we're going to load a RDD of type string from S3, map it into our advertiser stats. Then we're going to run our report. And then we're going to get those results and save them as a text file back, back to S3. So testing, how do we actually go about testing Spark jobs? So um, typically uh, we import like a local Spark context uh, variable, and so you can kind of assume it's, it's already loaded here. Um, then our test class will have a run method where we take in a seek of our um, case class lines. So these are the, the lines that represent our logs. And inside of there we can um, call this parallelize method. And what that'll do is that'll consume a seek and return an RDD back out. Um, so that's how we pass an RDD of uh, test objects into our report. And then you can just assert um, on this thing like an array. Um, so in this, in this run method, what you can do, um, and since this is returning an RDD, Spark has a method to turn an RDD back into an array. So in our test, we'll just call collect right here. Um, and that'll give us back an array. So we can say the first thing in this array, um, the view should be one. So that makes it really, really easy to test your, um, your Spark jobs. So downsides that we've encountered. Uh, the biggest pain point is usually manual partitioning. Um, this is something in Hive you don't have to worry about as much. Um, in Spark, you kind of have to say, like, I want my partition size to be 128 megabytes, and I want, like, this many partitions per, uh, or in my cluster. Um, so you're going to have to kind of like come up with your own heuristics on how you want to partition your data based on like the size of this stuff. Um, our general rules of thumb are we try not to go over about 10,000 partitions uh, because with our data we see that can blow up an instance if you get too much uh, data on a single partition. And uh, the other thing you have to be careful about is if you um, are doing co-groups or joins where you have um, very hot keys and you're just using the normal standard um, hash partitioner in Spark. Um, you're going to end up with a lot of data on a single partition, um, and so that could potentially blow up your instance and crash your job. Um, so you do have to be careful about that. 
But um, overall, our experience has actually been really, really good. Um, the benefits of you know, easy unit testing um, and extensibility have far outweighed any of the problems we've had. Um, we, we actually very rarely have a spark job crash. Um, you know, the, this out of memory stuff and um, the manual partitioning uh, was kind of more of like a one time thing as we were learning the, learning the platform. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's about all I have. Um, thanks for your time. So, I think uh, we have time for one or two questions. Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you moved from writing Hive queries to Scala. How did you manage the skills, the engineers or people who were working on SQL? Did you have to retrain? Did you hire new people? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing, right? Yeah, sure. So um, our company has actually always been like a Scala jobs shop to begin with. Um, so it was actually a fairly easy transition because um, everyone was already familiar with, with Scala. Um, so I think you know, we, we didn't have to deal with retraining or anything like that. One more question. Okay. Yeah, just in a similar vein, I'm curious, uh, was there a reason that you chose not to take your existing HiveQL assets, port it over into, spot, into Shark, and then just do your custom code in Scala? Yeah, certainly. Um, the, the biggest thing there is, is as soon as you move to the SQL language, it gets hard to test again. Um, you know, uh, it, it's much easier for, for us in like normal Scala code to do um, you know, kind of these unit tests. Um, so that's, that's why we, we did that. Cool. Let's thank the speaker. And we will resume back, given that we're late at 5 o'clock. Uh,